Your Excellencies, the Ministers from Somaliland, Your Excellencies, the members of the Persian uh, Parliament and Senate, His Excellency, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives of my country, Somaliland, Honourable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is indeed a great honour for me to be given this opportunity to speak for and on behalf of my country, Somaliland. And I'm very grateful to the people of Belgium for giving me this opportunity for the third or fourth time. Each time I am invited to your country, I come here with great pride and appreciation. And I welcome the opportunities that you give us to defend a cause that we wish to be defended Thank you. because it is a cause that, def that deserves to be defended. It is a cause that is just, a cause that is democratic, a cause that deserves support of all those who believe in human rights and human dignity. Before I go into my presentation, I have taken into account the fact that there will be ministers and other representatives of my country who will be speaking to you also about the different aspects of running a peaceful and stable nation like Somaliland. And I will try to limit myself to trying to give you a comparison between Somaliland and Somalia. But at the very outset, I would like all to know that Somaliland neither believes in fragmentation of states, neither believes in secession of nations, nor believes in terrorism <coughs> and the uh, denial of people's rights to dignity and to deciding their own destiny. Uh, I have spoken to you on many occasions, so it's always very difficult for me to try not to repeat myself. But until such time, as the uh, cause that we are trying to defend is understood, I'm afraid some of you will have to listen to us again and again. Because if I'm asked to describe that table, I will only be able to describe it as that table. On whichever other occasions I am required to do that, it will be the same description. So describing Somaliland yet one more time, is my honor to do so, and for some of you, you will have to listen to us again because we tend to repeat that message until it is heard, until it is believed, until it is appreciated and understood. <laughs> now, we all know that Somaliland is not a Biafra, or a South Sudan, or whatever the other nation has broken away from another one. Somaliland was part of the Great British Empire. And in 1883, a little bit before my time, there were treaties that were made by Britain France and Italy, and an agreement with the Ethiopian Empire. <laughs> and the Horn of Africa was divided into La Côte Française de Somalie, which you all know today as La République de Djibouti, which was once the French territory of the Afars and Issa, and before that, La Côte Française de Somalie. Next to it 
was British Somaliland Protectorate. And I underline that word, Protectorate. Because we had a treaty of protection with Great Britain, and Somaliland was on the cover. And next to it was La Somalia Italiana, which was one of the three colonies that Italy had on the continent of Africa. And the other two being Libya and Eritrea. <coughs> These were the three colonies that Italy had on the continent of Africa. And La Côte Française de Somalie, British Somaliland Protectorate, and La Somalia Italiana all had borders that were defined according to internationally recognized treaties. Anglo-French Treaty, Anglo-Italian Treaty, and Anglo-Ethiopian Treaty, because Somaliland shared a border with France, colony of colony France, the Ethiopian Empire, and the Italian colony of, it, of La Somalia Italiana. So the borders of Somaliland were not made by us. They were made in 1883, and they were ratified in your United Nations, and ratified by the Security Council of the United Nations. If I were to make those borders today, I would make Somaliland two or three times the size that it is. Because the people of Somaliland live on both sides of that border that was defining the British Somaliland Protectorate. But then I respect human rights, I respect international law, and I am not part of some people who may wish to change borders. That border remains, even though it is one third of what I would have made it, it remains where it is, because it is there based on international treaties that I respect and the world should also respect. <laughs> Another historical fact that I would like to share with those who may still have doubts is that Somaliland became independent from Great Britain on the 26th of June, 1960. The independence of Somaliland gave Somaliland that place in history to be the first born and fully sovereign, inter <coughs> totally independent nation. So Somaliland is the first born. Somaliland is the very first independent Somali nation when all the others were either still living under colonial rule or were part of another country, like the northern part of Kenya, inhabited by Somalis, is the northern frontier district of Kenya, or the Hod and the uh, fifth region of Ethiopia was still within Ethiopia. So Somaliland was that first war and the more senior of any subsequent partners that became independent Somali nations. That status, I would like to be remembered. We are not buying it. We are not begging for it. We don't even have to fight for it. It is there. History has given us that place, the senior and firstborn fully independent Somali nation. It will always be there. Whether some people like it or not, that's up to them. But there it is. And that's a fact that I would like defended by all those who believe in history and in justice. Now I would like to, since 1960, when Somaliland became independent from Great Britain, there was a time when Somaliland united with Somalia. Our neighbors, the Somali inhabitants, La Somalia Italiana, were the next who became independent. 
They became independent on the 1st of July, 1960. And we united with Somalia, not because there were international troops to make it happen, not because there were American Marines landing on the beaches, not because there were drones and oil troops. We united with Somalia because we wanted to, because we fought for it, because we campaigned for it, because we believed that this was the right thing to do. We believed in unity of nations. We believe in cooperation. We believe in collaborations of peoples to move forward. And we congratulate the European Union, who has a base and a headquarters in your great country, to have pioneered that in Europe. And today, you have the great European Union. We, too, wanted to have a great Horn of Africa, where all Somalis come together under one yoke and that's why my star on my flag has five points. One representing each nation. Not because international troops made me do it, but because our people wish to do it. Because our people believe in it. Unity is good when it works. And in 1969, and I will jump from 1960 after union with Somalia, I will jump the 1961 coup d'etat that wanted to dissolve the union we had with Somalia. I will jump all the other hardships that Somali land was endured during the union with Somalia. And I will jump to 1969. 69 to 91 gives you 22 years. I like figures, I like mathematics. And 22 years since 1991. So I will compare the 22 years that we were with Somalia from 69 to 91 with the 22 years that we have administration with Somalia. And those of you who attended my presentation last year probably saw the pictures of destruction that I had on the screen. You saw the bones of the mass from the mass graves. I informed you then that the United Nations had catalogued 26 mass graves, not in Rwanda, in Somaliland. 26 mass graves. There are probably more, but 26 have been catalogued by the United Nations containing the human remains of people, of children, as young as five years old. And I do not understand how anyone could put young children and their mothers into mass graves. You have to be really a coward to be afraid of a five-year-old and to put them in bulldozers in mass graves. I showed you pictures of the cities of Somaliland destroyed and leveled to the ground. I showed you pictures of homes and dwellings and hospitals and schools that were leveled to the ground because 95% of our country was destroyed and leveled to, leveled to the ground. Now at that time, when that was happening to our civilian population, and where a quarter of a million of our people were being killed, and where the one million of our people were seeking refuge in refugee camps, where was the international community then to stop that carnage and that injustice from happening? Why was the international community not taking part in a reconciliation between the people of Somaliland and the people of Somalia? to stop the injustices and the genocide that was taking place against the people of Somaliland. Maybe there was a, a place then for the international community to reconcile the differences of the people. But the international community gave us the deaf ear, turned its back on us, allowed a quarter of a million of our people to be killed, 
and left us to our own devices. In 1991, in 1991, I, for one, was one of the people who never thought that we could recover from that level of destruction. And I am known as an optimist. But at that time, when I saw my country level to the ground, I had my doubts. But I am so glad that I was wrong. Because my people have risen from the ashes. My people have risen from that level of destruction to where we are today. We have recovered from the summary imprisonments. We have recovered from all the injustices and we have moved forward. During those 22 years, 69 to 1991, schools were destroyed, destroyed. hospitals were destroyed, homes were destroyed, all without pity. For example, there would be university scholarships. And if a student applied for a place in either a university or for a scholarship, and if somebody understood or recognized their accent as someone coming from some other land, that place was denied to that student. And if, by some miracle, that student succeeded to get in, there would be so many obstacles put in the front on the road of that student that that student would have to just drop out and abandon the idea. That was, that was the cause that made many of our young people leave the country, flee some other land, and seek refuge in all of your great countries. I can imagine how many live in the Scandinavian countries. How many live in your country, in England, and North America. Some other lands are everywhere. Not because they were looking for that pavement that is paved with gold, but they were looking for safety and they wanted to be alive. They were being pushed out. But the economy of Somaliland was also destroyed. If at that time somebody wished to engage in, in, in business, they needed a license, they would need to go to Mogadishu. They would need to get a license there. They would need to register with the, with the Chamber of Commerce in Mogadishu, in Somalia. They would not have access to a bilateral collaboration and information on contacts. Embassies were in Somalia not in Somaliland. Banks were in Somalia, not in Somaliland. Business opportunities were in Somalia, not in Somaliland. Ports were in Somalia, not in Somaliland. And all of these were injustices perpetrated against the people of Somaliland to destroy the people of Somaliland. Now since the collapse, of the regime of Siad Bari. What has happened in Somalia? I'm sure you're all aware because billions of your taxpayers' money has been spent in Somalia. Not in Somaliland, in Somalia. You, the international you, the world you, has been spending money and making efforts to calm down the war and the disruption that has taken place in the former Italian Somalia. We all remember, and those of us who do not, who are not there, should read it up and look it up. The first reconciliation conference to take place to reconcile the people of Somalia happened in Djibouti, in the former colony of France in 1991 to reconcile Ali and the others. You've all heard of Ali There was Djibouti 1, there was Djibouti 2, 
and there were other GBT conferences. Then there were the uh, problems in Somalia when the CNN was there, when the American Marines were there, where 28 international troops were there, the Pakistanis were there, the Australians were there, the Canadians were there, the British were there, the French were there, probably Belgians as well. 28 nations were there, and your taxpayers' money was being spent in Mogadishu <laughs> to try and make the warlords of Somalia allow the food aid that was intended for the poor to reach the poor. We have all heard those footages of uh, Christian Amonfo in your camps in 92 and 93 demonstrating that international troops were protecting the rations that were intended for those poor and hungry young children and women. You all heard of Hussein Aidi. Who has not heard of Hussein Aidi? Not because he's a great scientist and somebody who's discovered or invented something very useful, but one of the warlords of Somalia. Who has not watched that, that even Hollywood movie, when it's dramatized. Aliman, uh, Heidi, Osman Ato, Hussein Finnish, I don't know how many. You have all spent your money to try and help Somalia to get a stable government. There was a Qasim, there was a Yusuf, uh, Gaiti, there was Abdullah Yusuf. Sheikh Sharif, there were the Shababs in between and the Islamic courts in between. You, the international you, have tried to help Somalia get a government time and time again since 1991. Each time there would be a hope and Somalia has a new government. Like the hope you have today. And there is a man called Hassan who was elected or nominated by his cronies in Mogadishu to say that he is going to be our government, our president. <coughs> not through public suffrage, not through universal suffrage, not through the ballot, not through elections, but a nomination by two or three hundred candidates, two or three thousand candidates whose vote was bought and paid for. No man or woman beyond the, the, the buildings of the parliament were consulted. And each time that a government would be made for Somalia, whether it's Haiti, Abdullah Yusuf, or Qasim, or uh, I don't know, all the, all the other warlords, Somaliland had hopes that maybe this time it will work because we would want a government that works to be in place in Somalia. We have vested interests to have a stable Somalia, to have a stable neighbor. We have vested interests because that man or woman who dies in Somalia is another Somali like me. We feel for them. We hurt when they hurt. We are sorry to see them suffer. We are not gloating over their misery. They are our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our people. We share much, but we are different in our decision to run our country the way we would wish to run it. And the way we have been running it for the past 22 years demonstrates that when governments have failed in Somalia, to run a stable country, Somaliland, in contrast, has demonstrated its tenacity, its competence, its ability to run a country that is stable, like Somaliland, that is democratic, like Somaliland, that is, its economy is growing, like Somaliland, whose people are coming back from refugee camps by the plane loads in Somaliland. So our track record of 22 years is finding it so difficult to accept and understand and realize that some
some other land means business. Good business. Democratic business. Peaceful business. We have today, I know that His Excellency, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources, are here. Eight 130 kilometers of coastline in Somaliland that are peaceful and pirate free. Not because there are international troops to make it happen, but because Somalilanders make sure that pirates do not infiltrate our waters. We do not wish to become like Somalia to acquire that name, the most pirate-infested waters. That is a description that Somalia can keep, and which we do not wish to share with And we use our resources and our energy to make sure that we maintain that stability on our waters so we can trade with our neighbors, so we can move our goods, so that others can go through that waterway, that international waterway from the Suez Canal to the Indian Ocean, past our shores with total freedom and total confidence that they will not be attacked by Somali pirates, as they would be once they leave the borders of Somaliland, once they go up to the tip of the horn and they get into Somalia, whatever region or name that region calls itself, is Somalia. And that's where they get into pirate-infested territories. Some other land doesn't wish to be part of that. And we make sure that even if you have a little woman like me to defend it, we will defend it to the last person. I know Europe had the benefit of a Marshall Plan. I know Europe 
had so much going for it to rebuild it. Somali landers did not have that benefit. We had no Marshall Plan, no world came to our rescue, nobody, no World Bank, no IMF, no bilateral aid came to help us rebuild our country. We did it our way, the best way we could, a little at a time, a house at a time, a street at a time, a landmine at a time. We did it in spite of the absence of political recognition of the sovereignty of the people of Somaliland. We did it without having to have your taxpayers come to us and do it for us. When we demobilized our militia, we spent less than $100,000 to do it. $100,000. That is probably how much <coughs> the international community pays one warlord to attend a peace and reconciliation conference. That's how much you spend on one warlord. We spent that amount to destabilize, to demobilize an entire powerful militia in Somalia. We did it with our money. And we did it our way. That's why it succeeded. What the international community has failed to achieve, the African Union has failed to achieve, the United Nations and the Security Council have failed to achieve in Somalia. Somalia found that message, that magic, the 100,000. Learn from it. Invite Somaliland to teach you how, to show you how. Invite Somaliland to be part of the solution for Somalia. Invite Somaliland to extend a hand of collaboration with our neighbors in Somalia who are really disintegrating into nothing. Do not focus only on the fact that Somaliland is striving for the recognition of its sovereignty. Do not focus on that alone. Somaliland can help you. Somaliland is willing to help you. Somaliland is able to help you. One of the facts, now if you had some money, would you invest in Somalia in a commercial enterprise? You would be making a, take a very big gamble. But in Somaliland, many have taken that position and invested in Somaliland because we have that track record of 22 years of stability and peace. Coca-Cola has built the second biggest Coca-Cola factory in Africa. Where, not in Somalia, where the international troops are defending it, but in Somaliland, where the, the militia we demobilized with 100,000 US dollars is protecting it. It's dual. If Somaliland can do it, anybody can do it. We have our people come home to Somaliland, they come for tourism. They bring their families. Most of these people are people living in the diaspora. I've seen many of you in her case with your kids and your families. You wouldn't be there if Somaliland were not stable. And the little airport in her case, which is now being repaired by the Berbera or whatever, sometimes receive 20, 25 flights a day. That's a message that needs to be heard. If it were not safe, 23 plane loads would not be landing there every day, bringing people back from Canada and America and Europe just for holidays. <coughs> it's a proof. In the past 22 years, we have developed a constitution. We have developed a system of governance. We have a government in place that has ministries and I know the ministers will be speaking about it. We have a functioning government, a disciplined army, a disciplined civil service, banking system. We've had elections, and that will be 
spoken about later today. We had political parties who compete, like all political parties compete. Everybody who competes with somebody wants to win. That's a natural, natural instinct of human beings. But they win, and we gratify it, and we get on with it. We have had your people with us during these elections, and you have even congratulated us, which we appreciate. British Prime Ministers and American Presidents have congratulated Somaliland for the peaceful elections that we have had. But then, for that stability to be maintained, it needs international support. And it needs a stable neighbor in Somalia. It needs a democratic neighbor in Somalia. It needs a territory that is free of Al Shabaab in Somalia. It needs the Horn of Africa to collaborate, to maintain peace and stability in the Horn. Because if we fall, Ethiopia falls. If we fall, Djibouti falls. If we fall, Somalia falls even further than it has for the past 20, 20 years. Somaliland is part of the equation, is part of the solution, is willing partner in this exercise. And one of the initiatives that was done in Great Britain is the uh, formation of the Somaliland Development Corporation, which is a, uh, an initiative that is designed to support trade and economy, economic development in Somaliland in the absence of banking and insurance. <coughs> now, <coughs> trade opportunities, many shy away because of the history of Somalia and they misassociate Somaliland with that. Now, increasing foreigners come. I have welcomed in uh, Koreans, Chinese, Indians, backpackers from Europe who are coming to Somaliland as tourists. If people as far away as China and Korea have found Somaliland a place to visit, why not people from Europe? So this is an extension, I'm extending an invitation to the people of Europe, because you are the headquarters of the European Union, to come and find our shores, to come and see a bird life, to come and see one of the best coasts in Africa. Help us develop it. Help us make it become a haven of peace and stability, because there are too many turmoils in this world. How many of you know that the world's biggest gypsum deposit is in Somaliland? How many of you know that Somaliland has oil and gas and minerals and coal? How many of you know that this ring that I am wearing in my left hand, you probably think is from Brazil, is an emerald from Somaliland? Why we wish to invite investors, we wish to invite traders, we wish to invite people to come and invest in Somaliland and help us develop it together. And I will now share, and of course, like every mother, I am proud of my baby. So the first picture you're going to see is the picture of my baby, my husband. Now, if an old woman can build a hospital like that in Somaliland, what do you think the world could do in Somaliland? So much more. So, so much more. And by the way, I live there. <laughs> and we, that's my army. My army of nurses and doctors and midwives. Because I strongly believe that if we do 
will not harness the energy that is in our youth, somebody will find a way to put a gun in their hands. I would rather place a syringe in their hands, a dressing in their hands, a forceps in their hands, a bedpan in their hands to help cure the illness. And these little girls, these young girls, are going to really go back to their beaches and help women to deliver. And uh, a little while ago, I wanted to discuss something. Anybody from Boraba? Just raise your hand. Somebody? Right here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One of these little girls in the red dress, she was the smallest of the students we had. And we used to call her lovely, with the word in my language means tiny. That girl is in a village called Harinat. Do any of you know where Harinat is? The mountain of Harinat? She is running a health service there. And the gratitude and the messages I get from there coming from that region because little Nafia is there saving lives, delivering babies, looking after pregnant women. That's what's about in this community. This is a hall in Somaliland where we have a graduation and as you can see we also have boys graduating. We do not discriminate against boys or girls. We discriminate, discriminate against ignorance. We discriminate against justice. And students who passes an exam and passes a test is welcome whether it's a boy or a girl. This is the inside of that Coca Cola factory. There are no international troops defending it. Some other landlords are defending it. How many of you have seen the Mansour Hotel or heard of it? That's the Mansour Hotel. It's one of the big hotels in Somaliland where tourists stay and conferences are held. And that if you come, you will also be invited to stay there or in the ambassador or in one of the other hundreds of other hotels that are spreading up in Somaliland. This is a building that I just took a picture of. New shops, glass. You don't build glass buildings in countries that are not stable. That is a loud message. There's no barricade. There's no concrete wall. There's no armored tank. There's no personal carrier in front of it. Just glass. In, in Somaliland, in Hargeisa. People go by their businesses, like they do in your streets. Furniture shops. A place for everybody. You like gold and, and elaborate Louis Casimir says furniture, you can find it in Hargeisa, go to elsewhere. <laughs> And if you want a good sense of humor, also come to Somaliland. Now, pictures there are women gold sellers. You see, these are all the silent messages that I would like you to hear. Women in that street sell hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gold, 21 and 22 karat gold, in little boxes, in little glass tops. And if these women feel confident enough to put their words, their gold, their absolute immunity, it delivers a lot of message that I would like the world to hear. How much, how many of you can put that much money in the street? And this is a small budget by the That is a small budget. And you have euros that will change it. You have dollars that will change it. You have British pounds, rials, or dirhams. They know the rate and they will sell it and change it for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have taken so much of your time that I hope I have left with you a message that Somaliland means well. Somaliland is doing well. Somaliland is a power, a force of nature that is sitting there waiting for the world 
to recognize it, recognize its achievements, recognize what it has, its potential, and extend that hand of friendship to the world. We are for peace. We are for stability. We are for democracy. We are not for fragmentation. We are not for the structure of nations and states. I thank you for your attention and I thank you for giving me this opportunity.